Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews, the show where we sit down with local elected leaders from all across Canada. Over the course of this episode, we will be learning about who our guest is, what drives them, and how they are working to make their community a better place for everyone who lives there. Now, today, we are honored to welcome to the show from the town of Quispamsis, New Brunswick, Councillor Noah Donovan. Noah, thank you for doing this. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. So I, 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 I think I, I, I practiced it about three times before we press record, but did I pronounce the name of the town correctly? <laughs> you, oh, you almost got it, but it, I find it is difficult for most people to say. Um, I, I don't understand why it, it is very simple, but I, I think that the long sort of name and, and the, the letter Q kind of messes people up a little bit, but it's it's Quispamsis. Well, does it so mean something? Like, it, yeah, it's an. I don't know exactly what it means, but it it is an indigenous um, name. Okay, um, but I want to thank you so much for sitting down and talking about your time in office and why your decision to get into the political arena. But before we do that, I want to start with the first question I ask most of my uh, uh, guests uh, who come on the show, and you're no exception. Where did your sense of duty to serve come from? <laughs> <laughs> that's a that's a funny question. I um I honestly never saw myself in in uh, politics. I don't know if I actually really wanted to be a politician, although it does really excite me. Um, I've done a lot of community work. You know, um, I'm still quite young, so I'm only 24. So, you know, um, growing up, I did a lot of uh, volunteering. So I volunteered with my mother at the nursing homes where she worked, and. Uh, you know, I did, uh, and I still do, I, I did backpacks uh, for the homeless, for uh, the city. Um, and, and I've always just sort of taken a, a leadership role on an active sort of um, step in trying to make uh, our community and, you know, the region that I live in a, a better place for all of us. So I, I don't know if I was deliberately looking to get into politics, but it's sort of, you know, just volunteering in the community and helping out. It, it allowed me to um, sort of get a head start in that. Um and yeah, it's I, I do find it interesting, but again, I think just volunteering the community and, and um, you know, just getting myself out there sort of helped me realize that, you know, if I had a, a um, position that was elected, if I was an elected official, then maybe I would be able to get some of the, the things that I wanted um, in our community or for our community done myself instead of having to, you know, rely on other people to try to um, get things done for me. You're a relatively newcomer to elected office. Uh, you're 24 years of old, 24 years of uh, old right now. Um, was it interesting being the young buck in the room when you were deciding to put your name forward and then getting elected? Or had you seen previous young people get involved in politics at the municipal level that you said, well, let's potentially throw my hat in because I need the youth uh, voice around the council table. Oh, yeah, that's a really good question. I didn't, honestly, I really didn't have any um, youth role models sort of in the municipal realm or even in the provincial um, realm uh, to look, to look at, to, to sort of make my decisions. Um, I got into politics thinking that, you know what, if, if there are people my age that don't see themselves on councils, then maybe, or, you know, in, in municipal or, or uh, provincial government, then maybe I can be that person. And obviously that is what I've come out to be. You know, I, I, it was very interesting. It was very hard to get used to in the beginning. And it still is very difficult because, um, you know, I'm still learning. I'm still getting uh, sort of the hang of things. Some, some members of my council have been on council for 30, 40 years. So, I mean, and, and to, to just sort of pop into that at my age, it's, it's been quite a, quite an adjustment. Um, but like I said, I, I do enjoy being up here and I do enjoy you know, representing all my citizens, but especially the ones that um, are younger and they, they maybe they don't feel like they have, you know, a voice in the community because they can't see themselves being represented on, on council. Well, we'll talk about your time on council in a few minutes. I want to talk about the journey to putting your name on the ballot. Um, I want to start with the sort of the backstory of who Noah is. While you didn't expect to be the politician, was did, was politics that something 
interested was politics in an interest of yours getting into sort of your 20s the, the early 20s and late teens because i remember going to university and college and i was the one person who didn't have sports cars on his uh, uh walls i had p- pictures of politicians premiers prime ministers and even mayors for you what was the turning point about the political arena that sort of drew you to it Honestly, I have been interested in politics. You know, I haven't been as hardcore as some people may be when it comes to politics, but I've always been the kid that will stay up, you know, on a school night until, you know, 12, 1 o'clock in the morning watching, you know, the Alberta or the Saskatchewan, you know, municipal and and, and provincial elections happen. And, and it's, I found that very interesting. I thought, you know, seeing those results roll in for some of these candidates, you know, I I got to research some of them and look into, you know, what their stances are, what their their policies they're looking for, and being able to see, you know, my favorites cross that finish line, it was almost like a sense of pride. I, I thought, you know, I could do that one day, and and I did do that. Um, you know, I, I I wasn't sure how to make the step into politics. You know, sometimes. You can get advice from people who have been in, in politics for a while, but there's not always like a set rule book or a set, you know, way to actually sort of step into that um, realm. So when I was doing it, I honestly, I, I was quite nervous. I was humming and hawing a lot. I was like, oh, should I should I run for council? Should I not? And at one point I thought, no, maybe maybe I would rather just wait and and see, you know, if I can, if I can get in, maybe when I'm a little bit older, because I honestly didn't have a whole lot of faith that I, as a young person, um, you know, much similarly to some of the other young people in my community who didn't see young people in politics, I honestly did not think that I would be able to get into politics. So when I finally did, it was quite a, quite an exciting experience to realize that, you know, some of these barriers that we put up for ourselves aren't actually there. You just need to be able to, you know, think clearly and, and sort of step forward and, and, and go for what you're actually uh, looking for. And, and I did that. What was the allure for municipal politics? Because I, I don't hear a lot of uh, young people saying that municipal politics is where it's at. <laughs> or it's where I want to start. They usually say I want to start federally or I want to start provincially. But for you... You made the leap into politics at the first level, well, the sort of the uh, the closest to the people level of government, which is the municipal level. What was the allure for you for that that d- decision to go municipally? I've always thought, and whether it's it's uh, it's an opinion that's popular with everybody or not, <laughs> I, I I've always thought that all politicians should start off municipally, and the reason I believe that is because it is. It is the, the government that's closest to the people. You know, you 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 have to do your time, so to speak, as, as people would say, you know, in the municipal realm so that you can understand, you know, some of the challenges uh, that your community faces, some of the challenges that people, businesses, organizations face. And that's just what I'm doing right now. I'm, I'm taking the time to listen to my constituents to actually work through some of the problems they have, or at least attempt to try to do that, um, you know, and and doing a lot of the community work that I've done, I've always just felt a little more comfortable uh, municipally because I feel like when you go provincially and federally, you start worrying less about the people you represent and more about, you know, maybe people across the country or people across the province. And then there's, there's also the fact that, you know, while municipal politics does have its fair share of drama, there's so much drama when you get in the federal and provincial politics. And I find that really distracts from, you know, what most politicians or people that get into politics actually want to do, which is to help people, you know. Um, I I have a lot of love for people who are in federal or provincial politics, because I think that takes a lot of determination and patience, um, which I do not have. I don't have patience for that at this time. Um, but I, I do think it's important that that um, people get to start in municipal politics. And if, if people were to ask me, you know, hey, I want to get into politics, I would tell them that. I would say, you know, you need to go into municipal first so that way you can get an understanding of, you know, the issues that are going to that are that are around here, because no matter what what um, level of government you go to, even though it gets further away from people, the issues are always typically the same. Doesn't matter what if you're provincial, federal or municipal. So if you can spend the time and actually have, 
you know, some of those intimate conversations with, you know, uh, community members, business owners, and people like that, then you can, you can better learn how to be a politician, so to speak, and, and it will help you along in your career. And it's certainly being able to, to talk to those people is helping me with mine. When you decided to put your name on the ballot in the last election, I believe it was the first time that you've put forward your name uh, in uh, yeah. for municipal politics. Was there an issue? Was there an issue that you said, I need this issue addressed? Because I've talked to many municipal councillors, mayors, Reeves, wardens across this great country, and they give me the range of topics, whether it be, I want it more transparency. I want it an upgrade it to a park. They, they talk about certain small micro issues that they got involved in. What was the issue for you? Was it just wanting to bring that voice or wanted to give a different perspective? Or was there something happening in the town that you said, I think I'm the one who can help bring a different perspective to solve this issue? Mostly for me, it was just being able to be the voice that I didn't see on council at that time. You know, I I have always believed in equality, no matter who you are, what your age is, what your orientation is, and and, and things like that. I, I've always believed that everybody should be represented. And, you know, that's not always the case in municipal po- or politics or any politics for that matter, you know, whether it's done intentionally or, or, you know, unintentionally. Sometimes people along the way get sort of missed when it comes to representation. And I, I felt very strongly about making sure that didn't happen. You know, when I... Before I ran, I, I was involved in the community a lot. I did a lot of um, things like backpacks for the homeless. I, I did yeah. programs with with uh, children with intellectual disabilities. I've worked with seniors, so I felt like I had that understanding. Um, you know, just maybe not just because I'm a youth, but I had that understanding that I could, um, you know, relate to a variety of people. I wasn't just, you know going to relate to one segment of the town i've had personal experience with all segments of our town and i and i think that's important i think as a politician you know you may not agree with everybody you may not understand everybody but you certainly have to be able to you know work towards the better good for for all for everybody in the town and i and i i'm trying my hardest to do that (laughs) while you may believe that you have a pulse on your community while you've given back you've volunteered your hours uh giving back to your community when you're in a campaign you learn about the individual issues that people are facing in your community so when you were out door knocking and talking to your the community that you wanted to elect you were you surprised at some of the issues that were being raised and were you taken back that while you thought you had a pulse on the community sometimes hearing from what people are suffering and what the challenges that they're facing can change your perspective and change your understanding of what a community is going through for you during that campaign. Did you find some of those issues coming forward or was it more of the issues that you as someone who's volunteered were aware of? Um, That's actually a really good question. Uh, I did, I was um, sort of, surprised by some of the issues, but most of them were issues that I had already planned to, you know, run into. Um, one of the main issues was, you know, we're a growing town. There are, my town has about 20,000 people and it's a suburb. And, you know, most suburbs are full of, you know, just single family homes and things like that, which is wonderful. I, I don't disagree with that with that sort of construct that they've created for suburbs. But the issue is, is we don't have many apartment buildings in our, in our town. And it's a town that is very mixed in um, the demographics. So, you know, we have a lot of kids graduating from high school every year and they're going off to post-secondary outside of the province or, or, you know, within the province. And they want to come back to my town. They want to, you know, be part of the town that they've always grown up in, but they're not able to. Because the option that they have is you either spend a fortune on a, an apartment or a a house or or what, what you can find, if you can find it, or you live with your parents. And those are two very hard options for people. And they, they often force um, the young people that we're, that we're looking to attract, that we're looking to retain. We often force them out of our town. And I don't think that's right. You know, I've always grown up in Quispamsis. You know, it's been my home forever. And I, I find that very upsetting that, you know, a lot of my friends 
um, that have left, that I've grown up with, they don't feel like they belong in this town anymore because there's just nowhere for them to go. So going through the election, housing was one of my main concerns. And again, just making sure that I represent people. You know, I, I got tired and tired and tired. Like I enjoyed hearing people's thoughts, but I get so tired of hearing the fact that they didn't feel represented. They didn't feel like anybody was listening, that there were people just sitting there and they've been there for so long. They're not doing anything. They're just sort of there. And I didn't want to be that person. I actually wanted to be somebody who came in, who listened, who had an open mind, regardless of what the issue is, because obviously sometimes there are some issues that, you know, are very unpopular and that can be scary to talk about. But I enjoy talking about them because I think it's what moves our, our community forward. You know, housing, for example, I think we need more apartment buildings. As a suburb, it's it can often be um, startling for people to think about having um, apartment buildings around them because you know, often people think that apartments are full of, you know, parties and, and young people and just a whole bunch of other, uh, you know, maybe unattractive things to them. But at the same time, I'm trying to convince people that, you know, we have to do something because your children that are growing up here and they're going off to post-secondary, they have nowhere to live. And same thing with their, their parents. You know, you've got two stark divides between them. You know, you've got the young people who are going off to college, university that can't come home. And then you've got the older generation, which is significantly um, growing in our town, who physically have to leave the town because there's nowhere for them to go. They can't, you know, they can't stay in a, in a four bedroom house anymore. They can't, they can't do that. They need something smaller and there just isn't anything. So I'm, I'm, I've been a very strong advocate of trying you know, and through my council voting history of voting for, you know, uh, mixed residential and, and apartment buildings, because, you know, again, while they're, they're unpopular, it's a very um, prevalent thing that we have to keep discussing, right? So how do you do that? How do you balance the needs of your community with what you believe is right? Because you, you've been elected by the people of your community to bring a voice to the council table, but also look towards the future of your community. And if I go talk to 100 people in your community, I guarantee you they're all going to tell me 100 different things about the issues that are prevalent to them and what they believe is right for the community. How do you weed through the information that you get from talking to residents, talking outside the uh, echo chamber that is social media, and come to a conclusion that is best for the community, but understanding that you're not going to please 100% of the people in your community on every mm -hmm. single issue you vote for. And you you laugh, but it's true. <laughs> oh, it is. Absolutely. I always, I have always, from the day that I got elected, held the rule that you know, you have to vote with what you think is right, because people put me here for a reason, um, not to sound cocky or anything, but it's just that's just how it is. Um, and, and it's also, you know, you have to remember that you're never going to please everybody. And I, in the beginning, I actually got kind of sick. I, I was like, I got really anxious coming to council because I desperately wanted to please every single person in the room. But then I learned very quickly that that's not possible and it's not worth getting yourself sick over. You know, I, I come into council every every meeting that we have with an open mind. You know, I don't have my mind made up on, on how I'm going to vote as soon as I get in the chamber. You know, I like to listen to um, the stories. You know, I've, I've sometimes I've, I've had, you know, thoughts of how, uh, you know, a certain public hearing or motion or whatever may go. And then I get listening to people and sort of the experiences they have and the the um, the questions or the concerns. And it totally changes my outlook on it. And I think that's the best part of, of a democ democracy is that people can voice their opinions and we can have an actual conversation about it. Sometimes, you know, those conversations get heated. They get uncomfortable. You know, it, it's it's it is upsetting sometimes because, you know, you have people who are very passionate about certain ideas and obviously only one side can sort of win the argument right so it, again I, I I don't go in with the idea of trying to please anybody everybody anymore because I can't I go in with trying to think about what I believe is right for all of us in the future you know I, it may not sound like it, it it would be the best idea now with some of the things that I, I would vote on but you have to think forward to the future and you have to think about you know 
the future of our of our residents, you know, now and, and ones that may be being born, right? Have you learned to say no in your position as counselor? Because I can imagine you get emails all the time from people saying, I want this done, or I want my sidewalks uh, 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 cleaned. I want uh, my park upgrade. But you know, and everyone who listens to the show knows that municipalities can't run deficits. You have a certain amount of money every year and you can't run a deficit. You have to spend within your limit. You have to apply for grants. Sometimes you get them, sometimes you don't. So you, at the end of the day, when people come to you and ask for million pro- million dollar project, new pool, new upgrade to the library, sometimes you have to say no. Has that become a hard thing for you to say? Um, naturally, yes, because I, <laughs> again, I please everybody, but um, I don't ever say no to people usually. I always, you know, try to find a solution, even if it's not the solution that maybe they were hoping for or maybe they, they wanted. Um, I found that sometimes if you listen to people and you actually sort of hear their concerns and you at least have a conversation about it, then maybe you can get somewhere. You know, it doesn't, not every solution involves money or time or, or anything like that. Sometimes it's just a matter of listening and sort of understanding what this person's going through or what they're, what they're coming up with and saying, you know, I, we can't, we might not be able to do it right now, but that's a great idea. And maybe we can do it in the future. Does and communication sort of come into play? Absolutely. I find it's very, it's very difficult for me because, um, you know, sometimes you get so many emails and it's like, you, you sometimes you think, oh, I can't respond to all of them, but I, I do. I try my very hardest to respond to every single person because I want people to feel like, you know, that they can talk to me whenever they need. You know, I, I'm not here for any other purpose other than trying to make our town, the one that we live in and share, a better place for all of us. So I find when when you have that open channel where people can email you, we can have a conversation. I find that works out really well. I, I've seen you know, in politics times when, you know, it's some politicians feel like it's easier just to sort of let it, let it be and not sort of engage. And, you know, sometimes, yes, that sounds like a great idea. You know, it's why would you want to get yourself in the middle of some tangled mess? But the other, again, going back to what I said before, sometimes you can create solutions that you actually didn't know were there. Sometimes it doesn't take, you know, a whole lot of manpower, money, effort to, to just sort of have a conversation and, and figure out where to go from there. What, what would you prefer having an actual conversation like we are right now or responding to people via Facebook? Because I can imagine as a counselor, you, you probably have rants and raves discussion boards in on Facebook for your community or discussion boards where people voice their opinion on the day-to-day operations of the town, but the day-to-day operations of what things are going on in the community. Do you take time to try and engage with the people who are on social media as well? Because we talk about the echo chamber that is social media, but sometimes it can be a good resource to connect with people who don't feel comfortable having this one-on-one personal conversation with people. I like having conversations on Facebook with people because you can reach more people. You can, you know, get, you can pass along information quicker than if I was to try to have a FaceTime call or a phone call with every person that has had an issue, right? You know, I'm always happy to, to do things like that, but I find even just chatting on Facebook, it's nice because it's, you know, Facebook or email, you can go at your own pace, you know, we can work through this together without having to put me on the spot because sometimes it happens often, but it's like, and I totally get it. But sometimes people don't understand that I don't have all the answers. I don't have all them right then. I can find them, which is why I prefer like email and Facebook, because then I, it allows me to have a conversation with, with a bunch of people all at once. And it allows me to go back to that conversation instead and, and sort of have a transcript of what we were talking about. So that way I don't have to try to mumble my way through, you know, figuring out things. <laughs> Earlier in in the conversation, you talked about uh, how the issues federally and provincially are the same that are happening municipally. Um, I want to know from you in your short time on being on council, have you found that your role as councillor is not what you expected and you're dealing with more provincial or federal matters when it comes to dealing with residents or even the issues that are coming forward to council? We don't need to get into specifics about what they are, 
but your role as counselor is no a role of a counselor is no longer just a municipal role. It's a provincial advocate. It's a federal advocate as well. Have you noticed that transition that what you expected and what you're doing now is not what it was going to be? Exactly. Exactly. I actually would classify myself as being part of the provincial government sometimes because with the amount of work they give us, I I I I am literally part of the provincial government. You know, maybe maybe not on paper or in person, but you know, metaphorically, I I literally am. You know, I've, we've been given, we've gone through local government's reform lately, and that's that has been hectic. You know, the the um, provincial government in New Brunswick has basically downloaded. A lot of the res responsibilities, including tourism, health, things like that, onto the municipalities. So you have to remember these municipalities that, you know, for, for decades and centuries have had their own issues. They now have to deal with a whole slew of provincial issues, which we are not prepared, you know, mentally, uh, financially, or just, you know, we don't even have the expertise sometimes to deal with some of those things. So it is, that's very frustrating. Um sometimes i don't how do you how do you balance that because i can imagine when someone comes to you a resident comes to you with a provincial issue it is clearly in the realm of the provincial government they don't want you to pass the buck and say it's not my issue you now have to take time out of your day as a municipal counselor and find the answer for them or find a way that they can get connected with a provincial represent representative is it hard to be a municipal counselor when there's so much downloading going on and you you feel like you are obligated to get the answer that the residents are looking for, even if it's not in your realm? It is difficult. And, you know, as much as I feel like I'm obligated, I am actually obligated. You know, I, I these people rely on me for just about everything. And, and sometimes that gets difficult because, you know, these provincial governments have staff they have tons of staff you know my municipality has tons of staff but my my staff and my municipality are focused on the community they're not focused on provincial matters but that's the that's the new norm that's what we're getting into and it's very unfortunate you know we don't have the time um or, or the resources to do things like that and, and sometimes the provincial government doesn't realize that or they just refuse to believe in <laughs> What's been the biggest learning curve for you in this job? Because I can imagine what you thought and what it is, is two different things. Getting into this job has, what's been the learning curve uh, for you? What, what's what been the learning curve for you? I, um, I believe it or not, I love to argue with people. <laughs> it's my favorite thing. I can't help myself sometimes. So sometimes during my council meeting, I'll have to sit here with my hands underneath underneath my chair just sort of waiting for it to be over because I I sometimes I just can't help myself you know it's we all have a variety of different opinions um some of them are right some of them are wrong um but nonetheless they're all important uh so for me it's been being able to you know listen to other people um even if I don't want to sometimes um you know it's that's very important because again at the end of the day we regardless of whether or not I like anybody that I'm working with, or, you know, if I have issues with somebody I'm working with, we still have to work together. We were elected together to serve the community. And at the end of the day, the community comes first before the, whether I have needs or not, you know what I mean? Like, if you, like that, that part has been difficult for me just trying to bite my tongue sometimes, uh, because I often have too much to say and it gets me in trouble, but <laughs> But isn't that the isn't that the great thing about municipal government though? Because while you may have a lot to say, you have the right to say it. And provincially and federally, you're not a liberal, you're not a conservative, you're not a green, you're not a, uh, a NDP. You are literally just an individual who's looking out for the best of their community. And you may disagree with the person who's across the aisle from you or across the table from you at the council tables. But at the end of the day, you can still go out and go grab a beer or go grab a coffee and just shoot the shit about what's going on in your community as well. Oh, absolutely. And, and that does happen. You know, I, I've gotten into situations where I've gotten flustered before, you know, it's been, you know, rough, like we've had rough discussions and you learn very quickly that you come into the council chambers, you listen, you talk, you hear, maybe you argue, you yell it out. And then as soon as you leave, it's done. You can't change things that have been voted on 
it's it's done that the, the the group has decided as a whole and sometimes you just have to go um with those things but again it can get very frustrating but you i think the important thing that everybody has to always remember is um to not let their own personal sort of politics agendas or you know views uh you know become the detriment of your community you know i again there's lots of things i don't agree on but i do them anyway because they benefit the community that i live in has the public life taken a toll on you yet because i can imagine for someone who enjoys debating and enjoys talking to people from what i'm gathering in this conversation going to the grocery store or going out to just to a restaurant with your friends and sitting down and having like a pizza or something you're probably going to get stopped from time to time you might be approached by people on the street saying counselor i need to take 10 minutes out of your schedule and i need to have this conversation right now because it's most important right now has the public has the public life of being a counselor taken a toll on you yet, or are you still adjusting to it? Uh, I would say I'm still adjusting to it a little bit. I actually had um, a lady stop me in uh, the superstore the other day, which is a grocery store. She stopped us there. She stopped me there, and she's like, "I'd love to talk to you." And I'm like, "Okay, I'd love to talk to you." You know what I mean? Like we had a good old conversation, and that was good. I don't I don't mind that. Um, I found it difficult. Uh, you know, being under a microscope sometimes, you know, you have to watch what you say very closely in council. And I've, I've found that difficult all, all, only because, you know, I'm very opinionated. I've always said what I've wanted to. Um, and then sometimes you just can't do that. <laughs> so I've, I'm often in the paper. I'm often on the radio, um, mostly for good things, never for bad. But it is, it is, uh, it is an interesting experience to be sitting at home or sitting in the car and you turn on the radio and then you're talking to yourself. That is an interesting experience. Uh, one that I still haven't gotten used to, but uh, it's an experience nonetheless and I'm thankful for it. Oh, oh I, I'm just cautious of time here. We're at the 30 minute mark yep. and I want to turn to a, a, sort of my favorite segment because I'll be coming to New Brunswick in November this year and I'm going to be making yep. a stop in your community. So as I have listeners from across Canada and around the world, what are some of the tourist spots that or the hidden gems of your community that you want people to visit while they're there? And I will be visiting them. So what you tell me, I'm going to be doing. So you better be sending me to some good places here, guys. <laughs> counselor <laughs> my, my favorite by far like my all-time favorite is the arts and culture park so it's a park right outside my town hall i can see it right outside my window here um during november december january it is lit up with a million lights so we literally have over a million lights out there and they're all leds there's you know there's um like uh statues and different you know like there's big giant gift boxes that are you know wrapped in leds and there's you know um different displays like there's a barn with a bunch of uh lighted up animals and things like that and we have we usually have the rink going so the rink is uh like the skate outdoor skating rink is directly in the middle of all this and it plays christmas music so during christmas time or you know the lead up to christmas it's very interesting just to be able to get out and go for a stroll um, it's, I find it very relaxing. I've been doing it since I was little. My family used to, to take me to it. Um, and now, uh, it just, it just so happens that I get to, you know, be part of the ceremony that kicks it off every year. And that's very, it's, it's sort of gone full circle for me. And sometimes I find that very difficult to, to comprehend because it's like, you know, I was from one, from one point in time, I was sitting there as a little child watching the lights go. And then now I'm sitting there actually launching the light so that's that's a very good uh it's a bit different but i enjoy it but that's honestly that's what i would do is the uh it's called um the holiday dreamland is what it's called and it's at the arts and culture park in quispamsis well hopefully it will be up and running when i visit there and i I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm attempting to get to the union of new brunswick municipalities conference later on this year for their agm so uh, we might be seeing each other there but after yes, a stressful sure. day after a stressful day at, uh, at council or after a stressful day of just being uh, a council member in your community is there a hidden spot that you go to to just decompress that you can just get away from and now you talked about the holiday lights in november 
But that's only in November, Jan- December, and January. Where else do you go in your community that you can get away and just recenter yourself? So my community, it's funny you should ask that. My community is very well known for its trail network. So we have over 27 kilometers of trails in our small little town. So it, it's you literally can go almost anywhere. So sometimes it's nice to, you know, before my council meetings or even just after them, um, just be able to go for a walk. You know, it sounds sounds kind of silly. People are like, why, why would you want to go for a walk? But sometimes it's just it's nice because it resets it resets your sort of it, it it helps me blow off steam from the council meetings or it helps me sort of get rid of my anxiety a little bit because not everybody realizes but you know I do get anxious and I have a lot of anxiety especially when I come into council because again I like to please everybody and obviously there's cameras and and microphones on me all the time so it, it is it's nice to be able to just walk out and go for a walk in one of our in one of our trails and we've got so many of them they're always well kept. You know, our staff do a wonderful job uh, keeping them keeping them going throughout the year. That's awesome. My last question, and this is the most important <laughs> one. This is the one that really sets you apart from all the other counselors across Canada. Oh, oh. <laughs> what makes your community such a unique place to live, to work, and to raise a family? See, that's a hard one. Well, it shouldn't be hard, but it is because the reason it's so hard is because there's so many things. You know, Chris Pimsis, we have we have the luxury of being near everything. You know, we're we're near the water. We've got uh, you know, Means Cove Beach, we've got Ritchie Lake. So we have plenty of water for people to kayak, to swim, to you know, boat, to, to do whatever you want. And we again we have so many trails. So I find, you know, not to put down any of the big cities or anything, you know, Calgary or onto Toronto or anything like that, but I was just there and it's, uh, I was in Toronto recently and it's so busy. I find it's so busy that sometimes people can lose track of the, their surroundings. And that doesn't happen in Quibus Pamsis. Everything here is slow, but it's like a comfortable slow. It's a, it's, it's a, it's a slow where you're able to actually catch your breath and enjoy the things around you without having to sacrifice anything. You know, we have so many trails. We have so many things to do here. Um, I wish I could list them all, but obviously we don't have time. But I, I would recommend that everybody come visit. You know, it's beautiful. It's it's a great place to, to raise a family. And, you know, 20,000 other people would agree. Counselor Noah, I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for sitting down and taking 40 minutes out of your day and doing this no interview. I, I, I say this a lot, but I say this with sincerity each time I say it. Canada, your community, and your province are better served with people like you at the council table. So I wish you all the best in the years to come as you continue your journey in municipal government. But I also want to say from the bottom of my heart, just keeping that voice for your community because it seems like you are a strong voice and a voice that is determined. So thank you so much. Thanks, Chris. And I'm glad that I had the chance to talk to you. So with that, I want to remind everyone, put down your phone for at least five minutes a day and go have a conversation with somebody, even if it's just with someone in your life right now. Until next time, this has been the Cross Border Interviews. And remember, just keep talking.